Hey everyone, welcome back to Trihackney's Advent of Cyber 2. I'm Dark, and today we're going to be doing Day 9, Anyone Can Be Santa. Day 9, Anyone Can Be Santa, the prelude. Even Santa has been having to adopt the work-from-home ethic in 2020, haven't we all? Uh, to help Santa out, Elf McSkitty and their team created a file server for the best festival company, TBFC, that uses the FTP protocol. However, an attacker was able to hack this new server. I really think that their IT team needs to reevaluate what they're doing. This has been every day now. This is uh, this is pretty bad. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to understand how this hack occurred and to retrace the steps of the attacker. So getting started, uh, as always, we're going to use the attack box for today. So start that by clicking the blue button in the top right hand corner of the page. And then we're going to go ahead and deploy the VM attached to this task as well. And then similar to days seven and eight, this day was also made by CMnatic, so make sure to give him some love. That's a link to his profile on Try Hack Me, and I definitely definitely recommend checking out the other rooms that he's made. He has an iOS forensics room that I did a video over, and it is wonderful. Uh, definitely re recommend checking that out. Um, Apple devices are very interesting, and especially when you start digging through things that uh, Apple doesn't necessarily want you to see, or the way things that uh, the way things are engineered is very, very cool. Um, and it's interesting to see to think about the design process that went in behind those. But I digress. Uh, today's learning objectives: understand the fundamentals of an FTP server and some common misconfigurations to ultimately exploit these ourselves to gain entry to TBFC-FTP-01. And that's going to be our target. I have my target IP over here. Uh, yours is going to be different. It might be the same, but make sure that you're attacking the right thing. What is FTP and where is it used? The file transfer protocol, FTP, offers a no thrills means of file sharing in comparison to the, the alternative protocols available. Uh, whilst this protocol is unencrypted, it can be accessed through a variety of means. From dedicated software such as FileZilla, which is what I traditionally use, the command line or web browsers, FTP servers have long been used to share files between devices across the internet due to its compatibility. And you can see that you can even just open it up in your web browser. Very, very nice. And you can just parse through everything there. Very cool. A lot of fun. Um, and I actually didn't even know you could just do this in a web browser. I knew you could do it in a bunch of different things, but that's very cool. And that's actually very pretty as well, the uh, way that it's presented. Accessing an FTP uh, server using the Mozilla Firefox browser here. And I might do that in this room just to have some fun with that. FTP uses two connections when transferring data, as illustrated below. So we have the actual data connection, and then we have the command connection. So we can see the commands go right here, and then we have the connection, uh, the actual data there that goes on another port. Um, and there's two ports that we ultimately end up using for this. We talked about this a little bit in the Wireshark task where we isolated that to actually find um, some data that was pulled via FTP. Um, and we were targeting port 21 for the uh, actual uh, community, the actual commands that were going there. Um, however, port 20 is going to be where that data ends up happening. Commands involve actions such as listing or navigating directories, writing to files, uh, whereas the data port is where the actual data, such as the uploading and downloading of files, are transferred over. So no credentials, no problem. Before any of the data can be shared, the client must log into the FTP server. This is determined the commands that the client has permission to execute and the data that can be shared, because you're not going to have access to everything traditionally. Some websites use FTP to share files instead of the web server itself. Of course, this means you'd have to share a username or password through some other way, but that's not always practical depending on what you're doing, especially if you want anyone on the internet to be able to download it very easily. Enter FTP's anonymous mode. This allows for a default username to be used with any password by a client. The user is treated like any other user on the server, including enforcing permissions and privileges to commands and data. So you can have things, you can have anonymous mode enabled on an FTP server, but you can also have privileged users that have access to more um, in case you just want to have things available. Using FTP over terminal. We're going to be using the FTP package that comes installed on most Linux environments but ex uh, especially the THM attack box. So this is installed by default. If it's not, you can do apt install FTP and it should take care of it. And that should grab the FTP package. 
To connect, we simply use the FT or use FTP and provide the IP address of the instance. In my case, I use FTP and then this is the target that he's logging into, but you would use, so this is the IP address that we're targeting. Um, and note that FTP is lowercase in that case. So we'll do FTP 10.10.249.124. And it's asking for our name, anonymous, uh, which we'll go over in a moment. And it's saying that we have anonymous access to the server. So we can see that it has anonymous mode enabled and we can see that we can just log in by tapping anonymous. You can use the help command to list some of the commands you can run whilst connected to the FTP server. And let's go ahead and do that now. And you may recognize a bunch of these. Most of these are just typical Linux commands, for example, dir or using ls, and we can do that right now. And using ls, we can see that we've got a bunch of different things in there. It looks like only one of them has data, so we might not have permissions to access these. So it looks like public is gonna be the one that we're interested in. But we can see that we've got a couple things here. We have ls, which is gonna list your files and directories, similar to what you can do with just normal Linux. Uh, fun fact, that command will work in PowerShell because it's aliased as long as it, I think it's PowerShell 2 or newer. Um, don't quote me on that version. I'm pretty sure I'm wrong. Uh, CD, we can change our current directory. So if we want to change into public, we can do CD public like so. We can use get to download a file from the file server, and then we can use put to upload a file to the server. Let's look at the directories available using ls. There's only one folder that data or with data that our user has permission to access and we can see that it is the public folder. Um, it's blurred out on here, but you can see it over here. We'll navigate to this using CD and use LS to list the contents and we can do that right over here. And we can see that we have a backup.sh and a shopping list.txt. So navigate to it. The file within this folder contains the, it contains a file with the .sh extension. This extension is a shell script that when executed will run commands that we program. Let's use get to get the file from the server onto our device so we understand why this file has been left here. So we're gonna go ahead and actually grab both. Do grab backup.sh and get shopping list.txt. And there we go. Finding our exploit. With the file downloaded, let's open it on our device using a terminal text editor such as Nano. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and type in exit here to close FTP. And you can see it even tells us goodbye. It's such a polite protocol. And we can see that I've got those two items. So we've got the shopping list.txt as well as backup.sh. So we'll cat, uh, we'll take a look at that in a moment. I think we're actually gonna use that for the challenge. Let me scroll down. I'm gonna go ahead and open it just to make things easier. So we'll do nano backup.sh. And there we go. We can see that this is a shell script. Uh, you can see that by the shebang here at the top, the bin bash, you need this to make it executable. Uh, typically, well, it's good practice. You can make it executable without this, uh, but it's pain in the butt. Uh, actually, specifically to further define that, just so that I don't leave any of you confused, um, if you have the .sh extension, I don't believe you actually need this, but if you don't have the .sh extension, um, which Linux doesn't actually look at these file extensions, it just kind of ignores it, uh, but you have the shebang, you can make it executable and it'll run without issues. Otherwise you need to call the shell in the uh, line if you don't have this, because it doesn't know what to do with that. So it looks like this was created by Elf Make Eager to back up all of Santa's goodies. So create backups to include the date, so it looks like we're creating our file name and then we're creating a tar of it to backup. Um, and then it looks like, like any good programmer, he has a to-do down here. Uh, automate transfer backups to the backup server. And we've got that over here too. We don't need to understand what happens here outside of the comments. The script executes every minute according to Elf McEager uh, and creates a backup of a folder and stores it in Elf McEager's home directory. Uh, running that every minute is going to create a lot of data. That's potentially uh, going to uh, actually cause a denial of service attack on yourself. So just be aware of that. Um, so it's putting in an elf to make yours home directory here, which we can see by this file path. What if we were to replace the commands executed in the script with our own malicious commands? Uploading a file requires a separate permission that shouldn't be granted to the anonymous user. However, permissions are pretty easy uh, 
to mess up in this case. And such is the case here. So let's use the pen test cheat sheet, which you can see right there, to get a good command that will be executed by the server to generate a shell to our attack box, replacing the IP address with your try hack me IP address, uh, which in my case, it's shown up here because I'm using the attack box. So we'll go up here and we have this command here, which I'm gonna copy on to here. Typically it's good practice to leave the functionality. I don't actually care about leaving the functionality because well, it is shouldn't have designed the script poorly in the first place. Um, what does that at the bottom? That'll be fine. Uh, yeah, that shouldn't mess anything up. It should all be treated as a comment. So we'll do bash dash I, and then we'll type this all out. And this is a just reverse shell that we're sending. So just bad things. And I'm going to send it back to, we'll do one, two, three, four. Actually, I'll, I'll be standard with the task and we'll do quad fours. Uh, this is the default one that Metasploit sends its shell back. So just be aware that port is super obvious uh, for what it's being used for there. There we go. So we've got everything typed out and hopefully I didn't make any typos there and I can do control X, Y, and then enter writing that back. Typically, it's good practice to create a copy of this and again, preserve that functionality. So you create a copy of it so you have the original one still available and then you preserve that functionality because if you're going to be a good red team operator, you don't want to have yourself get connect or, uh, detected by breaking things. So just be aware of that. Let's set up a netcat listener to catch our connection on the attack box. And I'm going to go ahead and do that in a new tab, which you can do by clicking the file button and then open tab, or you can do shift control T and we'll do netcat dash L V N P and then four fours. There we go. We'll now attempt to upload our militia script to the folder that we have write permissions on the FTP server to, uh, by returning to our FTP prompt and using the put command to put the file into that directory, ensuring that it is your current directory. So we're gonna go ahead um, and launch FTP from here and we'll do it against our attack. Here, let me cat my target again. Making sure that we run FTP against that host. 249124, anonymous. And we should not have put uh, permissions, but yet we do. We'll go to public. There we go. LS, making sure that we're in the right directory. And we'll do put backup.sh. Cool. And then we should get a listener at some point. I uh, return to our netcat listener and we'll see what happens. After waiting one minute, you should see an output like below. We'll have a reverse system shell on the FTP server as powerful uh, or as the most powerful user, which your FTP server shouldn't be running as root. Uh, that's really bad. Um, you shouldn't run services as root. So just be aware of that. Any commands now or you now uh, use will execute on the FTP server system. So we're just going to see if we get a reverse shell off that. Proceed to use commands similar to what we have. Um, and there we go. Yep, there we go. So we've got root on that server. Um, and we'll go into that in a moment. Proceed to use commands similar to what we have used up in our demonstration here uh, before to find the contents of the root.txt. Oh, uh, so we're going to go find our flag uh, located in the root directory. Let's break down exactly what happened here and the reasons why this exploit happened. So we take a look at our first step here. The FTP server has anonymous mode enabled, allowing us to authenticate. This is inherently insecure and has many uh, legitimate uses, though, um, especially if you're not if permissions are actually set up correctly, this wouldn't have been as big of an issue, but we still got sensitive data off the system because we found that that task was running. Um, and since that task is running as the root user, that's not good. And then let's see, we discovered that we have permission to upload and download files. Well, this is normal behavior for FTP servers. Anonymous users should not be able to upload files. We've interpreted uh, the information from a legitimate backup script um, to create a reverse shell onto our host. So we change that file to send us a reverse shell instead. And then the script executes as the root user, which is God on the Linux system. It's going to be your admin. Um, it's the system itself for, for more intensive purposes. 
Uh, this is also a vulnerability as we now have full access to the system. The use of this user should be restricted wherever possible. This should not be running as root. This should not be running as root. <laughs> if you have, if you're working in IT right now and you have like a web server that's running as root, go change it, please. That's a, that is a problem. <laughs> Because uh, if you're a bad person and you can run something bad on that system, uh, running things as root, well, it's super convenient as it tends to make things work better. Uh, yeah, attackers really appreciate it. Um, if I'm doing a penetration test of a web server and I can upload whatever the heck I want and you're running it as root, uh, you're going to make my day and you probably don't want to. Uh, the use of this user should be restricted wherever possible. If the script were to execute as elf make eager, we'd only have access to the system as that user, which is much, much less powerful. That's way less bad. It's still bad, but not nearly as bad. That goes from like critical to maybe a high. <laughs> it might still be a critical, but still bad. Conclusion. We're to go from here and additional material. We've covered the fundamentals of FTP servers and why they're still used today. Not only this, but we've also learned about the simple misconfigurations, uh, how they can lead to a full-blown hack on an FTP server. If you're keen to learn more, check out the network services room, and I'll have this linked in the video description. And then if you want to sharpen your skills, check out the anonymous challenge room, and I'll link this one as well. Super fun, pretty easy CTF, and I definitely recommend checking it out. I'm going to go ahead and pause here as always, and if you want to do the challenge by yourself, I've kind of already shown how to do it. Um, I dec definitely recommend going through it and running through that now. Um, however, after the break, I'm going to go through the challenge and we're going to go ahead and finish that up. And we're back. All right. So question one, name the directory on the FTP server that has data visible to the anonymous user. That is going to be the public directory. What script gets executed within this directory? We can do backup.sh. What movie did Santa have on his Christmas shopping list? We can go ahead and close that. You can also type by as well and be very polite to the FTP server. We're going to go ahead and cat. Uh, we have a shopping list. The Polar Express movie. Great movie as well. And then we have question four. Re-upload the script to contain malicious data just as we did in section 10.6. And we're going to go ahead and do cat on root flag.txt and there we go and i'm going to copy this out so i don't have to type all that and you can do this as well we'll copy that paste that down there and that is going to do it for day nine so if you have any questions as always i'm going to have the try hack me discord linked in the video description as well definitely recommend checking out these two rooms both of them i believe they're both free if i'm thinking correctly and um, they're both pretty easy. So definitely, especially at the skill set that you're at right now, if you've done the previous days, you'll have a lot of fun with these. So otherwise, I will see you guys tomorrow with day 10.